Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your show host, Barbara Raglan. And today we have a special guest, and he's going to be doing my first book review. I've never done a book review before. And his name is Kenneth Williams. He's a resident of Windsor, and he's writing about the Red Tails. And you know about the Red Tails because we had Connie Napier here, who was a Tuskegee Airman and talked about the Red Tails because he was a member of that crew. So welcome to Spotlight, Thank Kenneth you. Williams. It's very good to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, can you tell me something about yourself? Sure. Uh, as you said, I'm a Windsor resident. I've, I've been a Windsor resident for a little more than a decade and very much enjoy this town. Mm -hmm. I'm an attorney and an insurance executive. Um, actually, I was born and raised in Oklahoma, believe it or not. Went to school in upstate New York, and when I had an opportunity to decide where I wanted to live for the rest of my life, I chose Connecticut. Uh, met my wife here. We got married, have raised three kids here. Two of them are in college, and one is, is over at Sage Park. Okay. It's a great school. It is. Great. We're very pleased so far. It's a great town, yes. How did you get interested in writing? You know, it, it's funny. When my kids came along, um, I would make up little stories for them, bedtime okay. stories and other stories. Then I started to write the stories down. And they weren't very long. We were fewer than 10 pages. I was, I was, it was good if I had a beginning, a middle, and an end, mm. and they at least laughed somewhere in between. So, so that's how it got started. And, and I never really did it to be published uh, and didn't really publish any of those stories. They're, they're in little books and on scraps of paper scattered around our house and probably in every car we've owned in the last 10 years. But this book actually rose out of one of those stories. Uh, it was a story I called Crabby Old Uncle Roy, and it was about a, a kid, and his name was Chris, like my oldest son's name, and he had this sort of nasty, mean old uncle. And uh, it was a very short story. It was a story about bullying. His, the uncle was sort of his bully at home because he lived in their house, and then he was sort of bullied at school. So uh, I began to think about why this uncle is so mean and crabby. And that question, why is he so mean and crabby, grew into the book, Red Tail Heart, The Life and Love of a Tuskegee Airman. Considerably bigger and my first uh, piece of published material. So um, you were interested in a Tuskegee Airman. How did that evolve from your crabby old uncle? Absolutely. What, what happened was, I, 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 like I said, I asked that question, why is this guy crabby, you know? Mm -hmm. And what I determined ultimately was that, that he had lost the love of his life some 30 or more years ago. Right. And that was a person who he couldn't get to. So I determined, she, so she must be abroad, in this case in France. And how did I get Uncle Roy? How do I get Uncle Roy in France back in the 1940s? Okay. Well, the shortest distance between uh, here and there back then was the war. And, and uh, I, f I knew about the Tuskegee Airmen. I knew about how great they were, how accomplished they were in that time. And I thought, boy, that, that's what I want Roy to be, you know, a person of extraordinary accomplishment, uh, talent, and ability. You know, and, and at that time, flying, they, they, the plane they really came into their own on was the, the P-51 Mustang, mm -hmm. the most sophisticated airplane in the American arsenal at that time. So that's, that's how we got Roy there. And uh, the, the book is about a little bit about his life before the war, a good deal about during the war, and much about his life after the war. How long did it take you to write this book? Uh, it, from beginning to end, honestly, probably uh, about about two to two and a half years of writing, another year and a half or so to get the book published. Uh, and I literally, you know, like like a lot of new writers, you don't necessarily go about it deliberately. You right. you'll have a scrap of paper here, or a scrap of paper there. You know, sometimes I when I take the kids for ice cream. You know, the cone has that little bit of paper wrapped around it. Yeah. I would yeah. peel that paper off and write little notes <laughs> on those papers. <laughs> so at one point, I just decided, my wife was like, you know, you ought to write the book. You know, I, I, yeah. talk, I talked about it so much that, you know, we pulled all of those scraps of paper together 
And I said, I'll, I'll give myself 90 days to do that first draft, to write from beginning to end. And, and I did that in about a 90 day, maybe a 100 day period. And I got that first, the core of the story basically down in about 100 pages uh, in that. And then it was just a matter of developing it and giving it life from that point on. So how did you do your research? Oh, the research was very long. Um, and this is this thing, the, the book is fiction. But okay. I think that but the historical context, almost everything that happens around is accurate. So I, I, I have a couple of books on the airmen um, in my library now, mm -hmm. one of which I relied on heavily was a book called Black Nights. Mm -hmm. So actually picking it up, going through the paper, uh, watching interviews with people like Connie Napier, okay. like you did, who were there and, and had real experiences and hearing what they had to say. And then a considerable amount of research uh, on the internet about, mm -hmm. about not just the airmen, but about uh, Jim Crow, about uh, the civil rights movement, about other things that were happening from about 1935 through 1990 uh, mm -hmm. when the book uh, comes to its climax. Okay. Um, what about the love interest? The <laughs> love, that's the heart of the book. You know, it, it is a love story. Uh, okay. And this guy spends, you know, more a little more than 30 years of his life trying to get back to this woman he loves. Uh, and, and just not to reveal too much, but he was forcibly uh, repatriated, we like to say, back to the United States. Okay. And he was, his passport was taken, so he wasn't allowed to go back to France, and he, he couldn't get back to her. And, and a lot happens to him in between. He goes through a lot of trials and tribulations. But... About this romance, and, and, and one of the characters says that, you know, the greatest romance ever was the romance between Adam and Eve, the greatest romance in literature ever. And they said the reason for that is because Eve was all of woman to Adam. So no man could love any woman more than Adam loved Eve. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by the same token, Adam was all of man to Eve. So no woman could love any man more than Eve loved Adam. The love between Roy and Marie, that's, that's the crabby old uncle Roy, was just a notch below that. That's how strong it was. Okay. It was the kind of relationship that, that changed time. So that's, it, it, a few people have read the book, uh, and I, I thank all the Windsor residents who've, who've read the book. They've been very supportive. And, and they've gotten back to me, and, and uh, they've really been moved by the book, actually, and uh, by that romance. Uh, with the book, uh, what other kinds of uh, media are you going to use? Are you going to put it on, uh, not YouTube, but, uh, you know, the reader that, you know, people use now? Or even the um, talking books would be a good one. Have you done that, looked uh, into that? I, uh, talking books is, is some place I want to get. I know we were talking a little bit about Denzel Washington. I would love for him to, <laughs> to read my <laughs> book. Yeah. I'd love for him to act in a movie if yes. the book could be made into a movie. Yes. But it is available uh, through Barnes & Noble, uh, my publisher, Wild Child Publishing, and Amazon, oh, both good. as a paperback and in an e-version. So oh, if, you have, if you have one of those e-readers, the iPad, the Nook, or the, uh, the, the other reader, mm -hmm. you can get the book on those readers. Mm -hmm. So do you, now that you've gotten into the niche of becoming an author, have you, you decided to write more books, or how do you feel about it? Is this the first novel that you've published? This is the first novel I've written, first novel I've published. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a long, drawn-out, arduous <laughs> process, but okay. it was worth it. I mean, there's nothing like the feeling of getting that box delivered yeah. by UPS or the United States Postal Service mm -hmm. that has your book in it mm -hmm. and opening it up and, and, and seeing your name. I, uh, I have probably three fairly significant outlines for other books. You know, okay. Unfortunately, I, I would love to be a full-time writer, uh, but, but right now uh, I'm not. I, I, do other th you know, I still have to, to go to work every day. Yeah. But uh, if I could become a full-time writer, I would, and I'd churn out a book every year. You know, I have, I have outlines that I could do literally a book every year for the next five years if I did it full-time. Mm -hmm. 
so this this will tell this this book will tell you know if, if if people like it certainly you know write back to the place you you bought it and let them know that you like the book and, and that'll take me a long ways hopefully towards being a uh, full-time author um how has it been received within the family and your children because i understand you have children in college and it's interesting that um one of them went to Renbrook with Sid, my granddaughter. How did they like the book? They, the they, young audience, you know, the younger yeah, audience. The younger audience, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little tough for, for smaller ones. So it's, it's probably a book only suitable for high school and, and That's above. That's what I meant, yeah. Uh, they, they, the reception has been very good. Now, my kids particular, this is, this is one thing I did. You know, I didn't know if I'd ever write another book again. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, in my, in my way, <laughs> immortalize all of my friends and relatives uh, uh, through this book. So nearly every character in the book is named after a friend or relative. Okay. And, and my three kids are in there. Uh, my wife's family name is in there. My family members, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, high school friends, and I've had a couple <laughs> of high school friends to read the book. Now, their name is there, and that's my little way of, of, of honoring them. But the characters, and I have to say this, the characters don't necessarily reflect uh, the personalities of those people. Very important to say. Yes, <laughs> yes. It really I, is. I, I'll hear about it, even though I said that, I'm still going to hear about it. Yeah. Especially from my, my 80 some 80 plus year old aunt and uncle in Oklahoma. About Oklahoma, what's the difference between, I know there's a vast difference between Oklahoma and Connecticut. What? What really attracted you to Connecticut? There's, so, you know, it's just a different part of the country, you know, a different culture. What are the similarities and the differences? Yeah, the, the, the you know, the differences are vast. That that even understates it. Uh, you know, politically, Oklahoma is what you would call a red state. Connecticut, r red, yeah. super red. Connecticut is is considered a blue, blue state, state. Politi politically, yeah. almost purple. Mm -hmm. um, Oklahoma is, 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 a, is huge, wide open spaces, yeah. flat prairie land. So you could literally, you know, stand on, on your front porch and, and see a mile away mm -hmm. because it's flat. And uh, the people are more Western oriented. Oklahoma was one of the last states to come into the, the union. union. So those, these are like the exact opposite. Connecticut is a very small, compact state, very urbanized state. A state that was there at the beginning mm -hmm. of the formation of this country. There are buildings, uh, you know, 200 years older in Connecticut mm -hmm. than the state of Oklahoma. Um, and New Englanders, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, Southerners, I think, in general, and Oklahoma s sort of falls in this category, are mm -hmm. very friendly when they meet strangers. Yeah. You know, they and the, the kids say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, sir, and the the people in the grocery line thank you and hope that you come back a, li a little not not quite the same in new england but what i've learned about new englanders is once you become a friend, friend. you are a friend for mm -hmm. life and i must say uh, in places like oklahoma it's part of the culture to be nice there isn't a whole lot under it necessarily beyond that it's just part of the culture that's so, an interesting concept i never thought about that before because i i mean even when um my, you know, my parents were born down south, but they came up here when they were like two or three. And so, well, I never went down except for family reunions, but one time I had to stay with Sydney while Heidi did some training in Seattle. And everybody was just so friendly, you know, and it kind of took me aback because right. I was born and raised in Connecticut. But uh, I was just, so when I came home, uh, I was walking down Arrowbrook Road and speaking to everybody, and they're looking at me like, especially if they didn't know me, you know, and I said to myself, whoa, Barbara, back up. You're back, back up. in Connecticut. Yeah, back I, up. I tell my kids when we go to Oklahoma, when we get over, let's say we're flying, when we get over, let's say, uh, Missouri, I start okay. to, okay, you have to say yes and no, ma'am, yes. and mm -hmm. thank you. And people are going to speak much slower, so you're going to have to be patient with them, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to slow your speech down. And every house we go to, this is, I always tell them this, every house we go to of my relatives they're going to invite you to eat. Eat, definitely. Eat a definitely. little bit yeah. <laughs> because you'll have to eat at the next house. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just the way it is. The interesting thing about the book is, is both Connecticut, my, my character Chris and his uncle live on Tower Avenue in Hartford. Oh, isn't that so great? Connecticut is there and Oklahoma is there uh -huh. when you go back into Roy's past. So, mm -hmm. so what I think about both and, and, and sort of things I've learned being in both places 
you know, come in full force in that book. Yes, yes. That's, that's, you know, that's really very interesting. And it's true because I married a Southerner and um, we did have to eat every place, you know, and everybody wanted you to come for breakfast and, you know, I was so tired of fried apples and sausage and, you know, I don't like breakfast anyway, but you had to go to different people's houses all the time and they would be offended. If, if you, you didn't, that's right. That's if you didn't eat, right. that, that, it was it was very true. That's very steeped in the culture. My my wife was a vegetarian uh, before we were married, and I took her home to meet my relatives, and okay. she stayed with my aunt and uncle, and they were probably in their seventies yeah. at that point. And I told them, you know, she's a vegetarian, and they said, well, does she eat bacon? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she woke up. She woke up the next morning because they didn't know what a vegetarian was right. with a full spread mm -hmm. of everything, so that she could Definitely. choose from. And my 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 aunt always had five or six cakes and pies around the house. Oh so yeah. So she took a slice of each and and put it in front of my wife so she could choose from it. <laughs> you know, I I it says on the back of the book that you know I was raised by my functionally illiterate grandmother, mm -hmm. and I was, and she was a wonderful person. So, so what I learned from an academic perspective, I absolutely had to learn at school because there wasn't a lot of support from an academic perspective right. at home. And to have a teacher take you under your wing, to under his or her wing. And I, I was telling my wife the other day about my fourth grade science teacher. Mm -hmm. I came in without my homework and he said to me, I expect you to have your homework, you know, because you know, basically I expect more out of you. Yeah. And he gave me time to do it. And I never forgot that, that, that somebody is expecting more out of me, that, that particular teacher. And I doubt there was ever an occasion after that that I forgot my homework. It meant so much to you. Yes. Because yes, you had absolutely. someone there, you had a support system, which is very important. Right. You know, you really... and, and in my community, I, you know, we talk about the difference between Oklahoma and Connecticut again. Um, I was in segregated schools, kindergarten, first okay. and second grade mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. And we're talking 68, 69, and 70, mm -hmm. so very, very late in the game. Really? But yeah. uh, teachers, the teachers who, who I had, who I was exposed to back in that small town, were also the teachers that taught my mother and my uncles and aunts. So the distance between home and school was very, very small. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, you know, I never had a permanent record. You know, today kids talk about, well, I don't want that in my permanent record. Yeah. What I had was a phone call. If I did something at school, the teacher would pick up the phone, call my grandmother, and my grandmother would greet me at the door and, and basically say, boy, what's wrong with you? Because she, there was a very close relationship in, between the teacher and home. And, and when I was at school, that teacher was my mother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know... Um, in my younger years, I lived in a place, I lived in Bellevue Square. And um, it, it was a large area housing project. And I think it was one of the first ones in the country. You know, we called it the brickyard because it was made of all brick. And, um, but there were the elders and the parents that went to work and everyone. But if you did anything in school, I don't know how it happened, but before you could get out of Arsenal School Yard, there was Miss So and So yelling out of the window, "Girl, what did you do?" You know. And then by the time my mother got home, it trickled to all the buildings, and I got it when you know she came right, home right. because Miss Jones and Miss So and So had told her, and someone else had told her, and it was a, a very close knit. Um, I would say a community down there in Bellevue Square. And uh, we were talking about, I went to a funeral um, Monday, and we called it the Brickyard. And uh, most of the people that were there, they came from all over the country. And they were professionals and whatever, but they all talked about the Brickyard and what they did and how they grew up and how they played in the playground. So it was a close-knit right. Right. you know, area, but our schools weren't segregated. Um, we went to school with uh, different, different nationalities, and one interesting uh, thing that happened was a lot of the schools that, uh, a lot of the students that were in school um, lived like off Albany Avenue and whatever, and they were victims of uh, the uh, camps, you know, where, you know, their parents were 
they lived, I can't remember what you would call it, concentration camps. Mm -hmm. their, their relatives had died in right. constant German. Right. A lot of right. German people, I remember going up on Albany Avenue to uh, this Lenora Beer's house and jumping on her. They had feather beds. We didn't have feather beds, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. the German people did, and we went over there. And so it was. Um, a good mix, it, a good, a good. And I mean, if on Barber Street, it was like all Italian, and, and Blue Hills Avenue was all Jewish. And but we all went to school together, and we had a good time. And that, yeah. that I think that provides a certain richness to it life. It really the more does. People and cultures you're exposed to. Interestingly enough, the Holocaust does come into Red Tail Heart as well. Oh, um, good. One of the reasons that you'll find, if for people, when you read the book, one of the reasons that Roy is sent back to the United States has mm -hmm. to do with something he witnesses uh, and, and implicates what, at that time, people were calling the Jewish question. Yeah. So uh, that, that plays a part in this book a, as well. Um, um, and this is just events that happened uh, very near the end of the war. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if so our school is concerned, my wife, the first thing we, she and I try to do with our kids is to shorten the distance between home and school. We go to the school and meet the teachers and shake their hands. Yeah, and and ideally, we want them to know who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to know who they are. And we want them to know we are available for, for our kids. And you know, when you, look at, when you look at my kid, hopefully you'll see me and my wife as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. It is, and the teacher reacts to the children differently when they see that there's a parent that's interesting, interested in what she's doing, and they really have a good feeling about that. And not that they're not interested in all of the children, but they know that here I'm going to get some support, and this parent's going to understand and whatever. Absolutely. Whereas other to other, with other children, sometimes you can't get the parents involved or make them understand how important it is. And, and my kid knows, too. Oh, my, my dad knows my teacher yeah. on oh, a yeah. first-name basis. <laughs> you know, there, there's only so much I can do outside of the, you know, outside of the bounds of what's acceptable at yeah. school. Yeah, but it's important. It really, really is. And... Um, that's what makes good school systems, and uh, that's what makes people might someday think they could write a novel. <laughs> that's true. That's you know, very I, true. You know, that that thing, what I learned in first, second, third in high school, uh, all of that came into to, to writing this book. I, yeah. I was on the speech and debate team when I was in high school, which was an odd thing to do, but we mm -hmm. used to perform skits, uh, and we at some point we started writing skits for the morning mm -hmm. announcements. All of that. You know, and all, all of that influence uh, came back and, and helped me to, to, to write this book and hopefully write a compelling story that will change people's lives when they read it. When, if someone wants to uh, chat with you or get some more information, what did you have, websites that you could give us? Yes, I do have a website. It's redtailheart.com. That's one word, redtailheart.com. Okay. I also have a blog. Redtailheart at blogspot.com. Mm -hmm. uh, so in either one of those, on either one of those websites, they can uh, leave comments, contact me directly. On the Redtail Heart website, you can see some of the reviews that the book has received. You can all, there are also links to all of the places in the book. The book oh, spends a lot good. of time in France, particularly in Monet's garden, mm. which is one of the most beautiful gardens in the world. Have you ever been to France? I, I have not. In fact, this is the thing about this book is that it's all about Roy, but you find not so much out about Marie, his okay. wife and his love interest. So I have to go to France so that I, I'll have you know the information I need to write Marie's story. Mm -hmm. And my wife is going to make sure that that happens. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, France, I, I'm interested in going to Paris. I really am. And, um, and I'm glad that it, your book is like global, more global, because even though the Tuskegee Airmen, they flew all over, you know, right, and they right. flew over to Germany and whatever, but le at least your book talks about that. And uh, it might make people want to go over and see where Marie lived or look at the gardens that you just described. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's going to be very interesting reading, yeah. so I'm looking forward to yeah, I, reading that. I, yeah, I, and I hope people enjoy it. If if you saw the movie, the movie is a very good war movie about it, combat and fighting. It is. It was a good movie. I and, saw it. And my my book can be sort of like the backstory. You know, okay. What were people thinking? What were they doing? What were their lives like? Yeah, yeah. And there was a little love story between the Italian, you mm -hmm. know, 
and the pie, one of the pilots, you remember the one that got yes, killed? Yes, yes. So, um, and if that's covered in a different way in your book, you know, so it sounds like it's going to be good. I'm dying to read it. Um, would you like to say anything else or leave any <laughs> thought about your book or experience to people that might want to get involved in writing? Because I like the way you said you just jotted something down on a piece of paper and kept doing that. That's really good. I like that. Right. That's the, good. the difference for me was when I decided I'm going to dedicate this amount of time to get it done. And then okay. I said to myself, you know, I'm going to try to do one page a day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too much to expect to do four or five or even ten, but if I can just get, squeak out one page a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of a hundred days, you have a hundred pages. At the end of a year, you have three hundred pages. You know, when you're in the 250 page range, you have the, work, the beginnings, the, you have a novel. You know, so if you have those notes, those scraps, those ideas, and you got a word processor, you know, just dedicate a a specific amount of time mm -hmm. uh, to, to get it done. It can be done. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice to know that you're an attorney, so you can hang your shingle out. I will. <laughs> uh, do you have an office or something? Uh, Where do you work? Not, not at this point, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll certainly, I'll, I'm very seriously thinking about getting that set up quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've enjoyed having you. Um, and I'm so excited about the book, especially since you're my first book review and something that I'm really interested in, especially Connie Knapp here and you and the Red Tails, and it sort of follows along, and I really like that. So um, come and see us again. I will. Maybe thank not with you. another book, but something else. Thank okay? you. Okay? Yes. Thank absolutely. you so much. This is Barbara Raglan, and I learned something new today that uh, Ken Williams is also an attorney. So if you need a good lawyer, he's in Windsor. But I'm so pleased that we had such a nice conversation about his book and his experiences and that he's from Oklahoma, but he decided to settle in the Northeast and live in Windsor, which is one of the oldest towns um, in the country. So until next time, this is Barbara Raglan saying, be good to yourself and others. And if you want to write, take Ken's advice and jot things down on paper. And you never know what's going to come of it. Look what happened to him. So on the next, next time, be good to yourself and others. Thank you.